Well, welcome everyone to our uh, third, fourth, let's talk about Hanford episode. Um, my name is Ginger Wireman. Uh, tonight's episode is talk, uh, excuse me, it's called Salmon, Sturgeon and more. And we're going to be talking about the Hanford Reach. I'm Ginger Wireman. I'm a community outreach and environmental education specialist for the state of Washington with the nuclear waste program at the Department of Ecology. And normally um, I do a lot of outreach to classrooms and service clubs and such and talk about Hanford cleanup. And since we can't safely do that, we created this Let's Talk series to introduce subjects around Hanford cleanup, history, environmental issues, and tonight, fisheries. So we are excited tonight to have our colleague Paul Hoffarth from our sister agency, the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. And um, he'll tell you more about himself. But for now, I'd like to introduce you to my colleague, Ryan Miller. Hey everyone, and welcome to again to our another event. Uh, I'm Ryan Miller. I'm a media coordinator with the Nuclear Waste Program. Uh, so tonight, it's going to work kind of like our last couple of events have worked. We're going to start off with a presentation. Uh, this time, Paul's going to present on the Columbia River and fish in the Hanford Reach. And uh, following that, we're going to go into a live Q and A where we'll take your questions and answer as many as we can. Um, so again, these conversations are geared towards, uh, you know, to be kind of high level and to those who are getting to know more about the Hanford area, the Hanford Reach, um, you know, the Columbia River, or those who only know, you know, maybe specific parts, someone like refreshers. Uh, so we, we do ask that you gear your questions tonight specifically to the Columbia River and the fish in the Hanford Reach. Paul's area of expertise lies in that area, um, not specifically the Hanford site and cleanup specifically. Uh, if we do get any questions that kind of pertain to the river and Hanford cleanup, we will do our best to answer them. But again, that's not Paul's area of expertise. Uh, so we're just asking you to gear your questions towards, you know, the fish and the river and and that that side of things with the Hanford reach. Um, and if we do get any questions that we can't answer tonight, that is on these topics that we can't answer, then uh, we'll we'll follow up with you over an email after the event and and, and still get your questions answered. Um, so with that, uh, I'll go ahead and, and kick it over to Paul. Paul, do you want to go ahead and introduce yourself and explain a little bit about yourself and what you do, and, and then we can get started with our presentation tonight. Uh, absolutely. I'm Paul Hofarth. Uh, good evening, everybody. I work for Washington Fish and Wildlife. I'm the district fish biologist for the Tri-Cities area. I've been working in this area now for really since 2000. Um, Part of my responsibilities are managing the fish populations and the sport fisheries within the Hanford Reach area of the Columbia River. So we'll kind of give a kind of broad strokes today, just kind of do an overview of a few of the fish that inhabit the Hanford Reach. Um, any of you can reach out to me at any time. I'll include my email address here at the end of the presentation. Wonderful, and uh, we have Dana McFadden joining us today from Ecology too. She's going to be sharing uh, Paul's presentation, and we'll go ahead and get started here. All right, excellent. Uh, so we're going to be talking about the Hanford Reach, the river section of the Hanford Reach today. Uh, so uh, let's take a quick look at the Hanford Reach. Uh, so uh, many of you are familiar with the Hanford Reach area. Some of you may not be. Uh, so the Hanford Reach is roughly 50 miles of river uh, that starts just north of Richland, Washington, and goes upstream to Priest Rapids Dam. That's the area of that we consider the Hanford Reach. It's part of the much larger McNary Reservoir. Uh, so as you're most most are aware, the hydroelectric projects have really can can form the Columbia River and Snake River into a series of reservoirs. Uh, so. Hanford Reach is included as part of McNary Reservoir. McNary Reservoir stretches from McNary Dam up to Ice Harbor on the Snake River, up to Priest Rapids Dam on the Columbia River. Uh, so it is a very unique section of the Columbia. A uh, couple of things I want to point out. It's bordered primarily on the west with the Department of Energy's Hanford site. Uh, to the east and southeast primarily, uh, you can see it's largely, largely agricultural. Uh, as you move up to the northeast, we've got the Hanford Reach National Monument that borders on that northeast corner. Uh, another thing that some folks may not be aware of, there are two large production hatcheries located within the Hanford Reach. Priest Rapids Hatchery, which is located just downstream of Priest Rapids Dam, and also Ringgold Springs Hatchery uh, located in Franklin County there on the east shoreline. 
So what the hell? Um, some of the unique features of the Hanford Reach are these island complexes. Uh, if you look at it, starting from Richland, Washington, uh, going up through the Ringgold Springs area, Savage Island area, there's the old Hanford town site. Uh, going on through what we call the White Bluffs area, those beautiful White Bluffs uh, to the east side of the river. And also there's one more unique little island. Uh, it's called Bernita Bar. It's just a small bar located just downstream of Priest Rapids Dam. It may not seem like much, but about 25% of our salmon spawn on that little island there. So it's a, a very unique feature within the Hanford Reach. One thing um, about the Hanford Reach has been called the last free flowing section of the Columbia River. Uh, it's a little bit of a misnomer. It does behave a lot more like a natural river system than it does like an impounded reservoir. That is, you have high velocity flows uh, going in and out through the reach. But unlike a natural river, it's heavily regulated by uh, really by power demand. So if you look at the Hanford Reach, I took a, a quick snapshot when I was putting this presentation together just to give you an idea of what goes on in the Hanford Reach. Uh, most of us don't realize that when we flip a light switch, uh, there's water being flushed through a dam somewhere. So as the power demand goes up, uh, the hydroelectric projects have to move up correspondingly. The little dots you see are here at midnight. And so most of our power uses is during the daylight hours. So you see this big spike in water moving through the Columbia River for power generation during daylight hours and a sharp drop every evening, you know, basically once we go to sleep and the businesses turns off their lights and power demands. And so you see this constant fluctuation this is in uh, cubic feet per second. So you can see in this one little weekly snapshot, flows went from about 155,000 CFS down to as low as about 55,000 CFS. Now, this may not mean much to you until you're out on the river. This actually equates to the river actually going up and down about 10 feet. Uh, if you can imagine me down the river and see the river change by 10 feet, it's, it's pretty impressive. And this happens almost daily. Uh, we see this constant movement of water up and down. The fish that inhabit the Hanford Reach must adapt to this ever-changing environment, constantly changing flows, river elevations, islands come and go. Uh, so it is a very unique environment for fish. Uh, just to kind of illustrate this, this is the Ringgold Springs hatchery access area. Uh, to the left is the Ringgold Springs access at lower flows. You can see there's trails and roadways running along the riverside. It's a really nice little bank fishery uh, for salmon during the fall. There's also a primitive boat launch there, uh, lots of parking areas. That's down at about, oh, say 70, 80,000 uh, cubic feet per second. To the right is the exact same area at around 200,000 cubic feet per second. Uh, you can see fishing the shoreline is going to be extremely difficult unless you brought a tree stand. Uh, so this is an ever-changing environment. Um, one more little snapshot I'll show you is the White Bluffs area. These are the White Bluffs island complexes that I alluded to before. Uh, the float on the left is those islands at relatively low water elevations. And you can see lots of little islands, fairly large islands. As the flows come up, the smaller islands disappear. It's large sections of the larger islands also disappear and sloughs tend to change into waterways uh, very quickly. So it is a very, very unique environment. If you're ever boating or moving around in the reach, uh, it can be a slightly challenging. Uh, so it's something to be aware of when you're in the reach and it is a unique feature you know, to the Hanford Reach itself. Uh, if you do want to boat in the reach, I would highly recommend it. Uh, you can go with somebody that knows the river, uh, hopefully there's still some charters that go through the reach. Uh, there's some very simple maps out there. There's two or three different maps uh, that'll at least show you the main channels and the islands that'll help you navigate. In addition to the maps, uh, you really do need to know what the hourly flows are. There's two really fantastic websites, one with the Army Corps of Engineers and one with the U.S. Geological Survey. Uh, the one for the Corps of Engineers, actually you can get the flows out of any dam in the Northwest from this website. Uh, likewise, with the USGS site, you can go to almost all the smaller tributaries in the state and some of the main stem rivers and get that real time flow information. So it'll show you flows that just happened within hours. Uh, so very useful data. 
if you're going to navigate the reach, reach or especially if you're going to go fishing in the reach, it's a real good idea to know what the water is doing, whether it's coming up or going down and where it's at. So now on to the fish. There's about 33 different species of fish that inhabit the Hanford Reach. Some of these are relatively rare. Some of them are very common. Some of them are only here for a short period of time. It's kind of a migration corridor for fish going into and out of the upper Columbia River. Uh, we're gonna just highlight just a few of these today. Just be aware, there's a lot of species out there. Uh, some of them I'm to talk about, there's some very popular sport fisheries in the reach. Uh, we now have a really terrific sockeye salmon fishery. Uh, coupled with that is often summer Chinook. Uh, we also have the fall Chinook salmon fishery that's going on right now. Uh, we've got a coho salmon uh, coming out of Ringgold Springs. It's a new production that just started. Uh, we get our first adults back this year. We've got summer steelhead. Uh, we've got white sturgeon, uh, walleye, smallmouth bass, mountain whitefish. And we even have a sport reward fishery for northern pike minnow where you can make five to eight dollars per fish uh, for helping us remove these pike minnow from the columbia river um, many of our salmon populations are fairly heavily managed uh, and they're managed basically on this depending on the strength of the run that is if we have more fish coming back we're able to allocate more fish to our anglers and part of my job is trying to keep tabs on how many fish were allocated and where we're at in that allocation as the season progresses. Uh, first thing I want to fish, I'm really going to highlight is white sturgeon. These are incredible fish. They're one of my favorites. It's the largest freshwater fish in North America. These things, not uncommon at all to be over 10 feet long, 500 pounds, just really huge, magnificent fish. Uh, they haven't identified as a species of greatest con conservation need in Washington. This is primarily because with the state of Washington and the development of the hydroelectric system that we now have in the Columbia Snake Rivers, these fish once, once, once roamed from the Pacific Ocean all the way up to Canada and all the way into Idaho. Uh, now with a series of dams, these populations are basically isolated. So now we've got a series of smaller isolated populations. Some of them are really not able to maintain themselves. Uh, one thing about sturgeon, uh, be aware in the state of Washington, it's illegal to hold a large sturgeon out of the water. It's really not good for the fish. Uh, usually just the battle of the fish uh, can stress these things out. Uh, so be really kind to these guys. They're pretty robust fish. They can take a fair amount of handling, uh, but we do ask that you keep them in the water. Uh, one other thing that we put in is we have sturgeon sanctuaries during the summer months now uh, below most of our dams. Uh, this is from May through August. This is the time of year when these sturgeon are going to be spawning. Uh, it's the most stressful time for these fish. Uh, they're spawning, there's warmer water temperatures. And so basically we eliminate any fishing for sturgeon in those sanctuaries for those few months, just to give them a little bit of break and hopefully get some successful spawning from these guys. Um, a little bit about the population in the Hanford Reach. Uh, it's unfortunate, we've only been able to do two population surveys really in the last 30 plus years in the Hanford Reach, uh, one back in 95, one in 2011. Um, if you look at the number, especially the totals down at the bottom, you say, well, it went up by you know about a thousand fish, which sounds good. Uh, if you look a little closer at the numbers, there's a couple of things going on here. One is we lost about 14% of our, our really nice, big, mature fish. Another thing that we found out is about a third of those fish in 2011 weren't naturally produced in the Hanford Reach. There were actually there were several supplementation programs going on in the Upper Columbia. Those res reservoirs have very limited sturgeon populations, so they're using hatchery supplementation to supplement those wild populations. Uh, luckily, the Hanford Reach is benefiting from those supplementation programs because a portion of those fish are working their way down through the Columbia River system and ending up in the Hanford Reach. Uh, so though we may not be quite maintaining ourselves as well as we'd like, we are getting a little assistance uh, from the Upper Columbia programs. Uh, to kind of put the McNary Pool population in perspective compared to some of the bigger populations in the lower river, um, for McNary Pool, McNary Reservoir, you can see we average about 7,700. This is lower than those other numbers you see because I'm looking at fish just in the, the 35 to 65 inch range. Uh, which is where our gear works is most effective and we feel most strongly 
that are uh, estimates around that size range are fairly accurate. Uh, you can see in John Day pool, the population is almost three times as large, much greater as you move closer and closer down river, uh, much better recruitment, much better production once you get in those lower river pools. Uh, once again, this was a comparison of sturgeon between 33 to 65 inches. Uh, one of the things we found in the Hanford Reach, uh, one thing to realize first off is sturgeon don't spawn every year. They may skip years. And so not all sturgeon will mature each year. Uh, of those that do spawn, uh, we actually go out and try and determine if they're successful. Um, not just spawning, but are they actually producing young? One of the things we do, it's called a, a zero age index, is we go out and try and find the young sturgeon shortly after they've hatched out and should be moving around in the reservoir. Uh, the numbers you see here uh, kind of reflect what, how, 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 how many fish are out there. So you can see for McNary pool, uh, many years we've got zeros or extremely low numbers, 300s of a percent, 600s of a percent, just very, very, either no recruitment, meaning we're not getting any juveniles out of the fish that do spawn, uh, or very, very few. As you go down river, you can see recruitment's quite a bit better. Uh, when there's sturgeon spawn, these fish are making it up to larger stages to where they have the you know, ability basically to grow in a, some sizable fish. And so you can see we've got relatively poor recruitment uh, from the McNary pool. Uh, sturgeon need ex extremely high turbid flows. I can't stress that enough. What you see right now in the springtime, especially if you look below a dam, it looks like incredibly high flows. Uh, but once again, if you look at the Columbia pre dam, uh, you can only imagine what the flows were like. I imagine Salido Falls had to have been one of the major spawning areas. And so whenever these flows get so high that we're freaking out and having challenges, the sturgeon are loving it. Uh, so once again, really high and some turbidity. When these sturgeon lay their eggs, everybody loves a sturgeon egg. Same thing after they hatch out, they're still very vulnerable to predation. So they really need to get up to about that 12 inch mark before they really start able to hold their own. Uh, one thing, um, especially in the Tri-Cities area, I think most people didn't realize sturgeon were out there, you know, until you have a 10 footer wash up in your backyard. Uh, we did have a very large sturgeon mortality event back in 2015. Uh, I personally went out there and did several surveys. Um, I recovered 62 sturgeon in McNary pool. We recovered more than that in the John Day pool. Um, so what we think that was, poor flash there, Dana. Uh, so 2015, 62 sturgeon, they averaged eight feet in length. So these weren't the little guys who were dying. These were large fish and they ranged from five feet up to over almost 10 feet in length. So these were very large fish that we were finding dead, which is really unfortunate. That's the size of the fish when they really began to put out a lot of eggs, a lot of reproduction potential there. Uh, what we've kind of discovered in that year, in that event, this is really a combination of several factors. One, we had elevated water temperatures in late June and early July, way sooner than what we usually have. Um, we had an overabundance of prey. Those that remember, we had a half million sockeye come back to the Columbia River that year. Unfortunately, the river temperatures came up early. Uh, only a very small proportion of those sockeye made it to Canada. A lot of them were dying throughout the Columbia River system. Uh, and the sturgeon were just preying heavily on these sockeye. Every sturgeon I dissected was absolutely stuffed full of sockeye. The other thing, I mentioned the spawn timing during these summer months. And so these fish were going into that spawn mode. And so the stressor between really overeating, uh, spawning and elevated water temperatures, we think is what really did the trick and caused those mortalities. They've seen similar events up in the Fraser River in Canada on a couple of occasions. Uh, to kind of tell you more about this, this year we had really similar water temperatures, uh, very warm, very early. Uh, this year, uh, we've only had one mortality, actually I just had a second one yesterday. One or two is kind of normal. Uh, that can be a uh, cause of a variety of different factors. Uh, so most years, this is not an issue. This year, we only had 150,000 sockeye. 
uh, which is terrific. Uh, but most of those sockeye made it through the Columbia River system while the temperatures were still cool enough. We didn't see the big mortality to the sockeye. And so everybody seemed to get through the system just fine this year, despite these warmer water temperatures. For white sturgeon management right now, uh, we did move to catch and release only uh, effective in February 2020. So this is a fairly recent rule. Up to that, we used to have year round fisheries, then we had a six month fishery. Uh, looking at our populations and the, the, what we do know about it, we just didn't feel like we could that we could support a harvest program in uh, McNary Reservoir at this point in time. So we moved it to catch and release for now. Uh, this population should continue to maintain itself. Uh, plus, we're going to have those Upper Columbia River supplementation programs, and they'll continue to provide us more fish as some of their fish work their way downstream and into the Hamper Reach. Uh, we are very actively pursuing funding uh, to try and get a routine population assessment. It's the really the one tool that we really need to manage this population properly. Uh, we, the lower river has a crew that rotates. They do each pool about every four years. And so they're able to actively manage that population. They're able to provide some level of harvest as well. Uh, right now, we don't have that piece. We know we're missing it and we're, we're actively trying to pursue funding. Uh, so we can start doing a better job of monitoring that population. Uh, some other popular fish with anglers, walleye and smallmouth bass are hugely popular in the Hanford Reach, as well as the whole Columbia River system. Uh, some of you may not know, these are not native fish. Uh, like probably half the species in the Northwest, they were brought over, uh, really walleye and smallmouth bass, really within like the last 50 years. Uh, they like it. Uh, they do very well. Uh, we have very robust populations of both walleye and smallmouth bass. Uh, you, most people would consider it a world-class fishery. Uh, on the right is the current state record walleye. It wasn't caught in the Hamper Reach, but just a little bit downstream, but it was in McNary Reservoir in 2014. That broke the prior state record, which was caught in the same area a couple of years prior, 20 pounds. Uh, currently right now, the Washington and Oregon state records are number four and five in the country. Uh, Oregon State record was caught below McNary Dam. So really the same general area of the Columbia River, really incredible fish. Uh, we have people that come from Canada and the Midwest, Southeast to fish for walleye in our area. Also smallmouth bass, the state record holder is still from the Hanford Reach. It was set back in 1966 at eight and three quarters pounds. Uh, I get to look through all the tournament data uh, for the most part, our tournament weights have been consistent from year to year to year. So we're still producing uh, fantastic smallmouth bass and walleye, uh, much to the chagrin of some of the salmon managers and much to the delight of our warm water fishermen. Uh, one of the fish I'll mention is channel catfish. Uh, we do have them in the Columbia River. Um, they're a lot easier to catch if you move into the tributaries, usually the Yakima River, the Walla Walla River, especially through the spring and the summer. Uh, but we do have a very large population of channel cats. There's a smallmouth bass there to the right. That one's actually caught out of the Yakima River. Uh, but you can see these are fantastic fish. Uh, bottom left is a mountain whitefish. Uh, these are scattered throughout the Hanford Reach, fairly large population. And we do have a, a pretty robust fishery in the fall. These fish tend to congregate in those salmon spawning areas, gobbling up those excess eggs that wash out of the nest. Uh, to the bottom right is a three spine stickleback. Uh, nobody fishes for these. They're only about one to three inches long, uh, but they're very abundant in the Hanford Reach, and they're just a cute little fish if you ever run across them. Uh, most people I know that see them are digging them out of their irrigation filters, uh, but they are a unique fish, uh, and they are fairly abundant in the reach. Now on to the anadromous fish. Uh, for you girls that aren't familiar with it, anadromous just means basically these fish spend some portion of their life cycle in the ocean. Most of them will spend one to three years in fresh water, uh, go to the ocean for once again, one to five years uh, before returning back to fresh water to spawn and start to cycle over again. Uh, the Hanford Reach is the home of the Hanford Reach Upriver Bright Fall Chinook. I'll go into some more details about this particular uh, fish here very shortly. Uh, we also have, have hatchery production for fall Chinook, uh, both Priest Rapids and Ringgold Springs Hatchery. We have summer steelhead being produced from Ringgold Springs Hatchery. 
And we now have the coho I was talking about being produced from Ringgold Springs Hatchery. Uh, in addition to the anadromous fish that we have within the Hamper Reach, uh, this is a major migration corridor for both juvenile and adult salmon from the Upper Columbia. So we've got Upper Columbia Springs, Summer and Fall Run Chinook coming through here, Upper Columbia Steelhead, Upper Columbia Coho. We also have all the sockeye, uh, which are bound either to Canada over to Lake Wenatchee. Uh, another one species that you may not be aware of, there's actually several specific lamprey that migrate through the reach. And actually the juveniles come downstream, the little amicids, the juveniles will come in and you can actually find them in the sediments within the Hanford Reach. They'll rear there in the mud for several years before moving back out to the ocean, just like our salmon. So uh, something you'll, you'll likely not see unless you go to one of the counting windows, uh, the viewing rooms, a few of those are still open. If you haven't been over to Ice Harbor Dam, they've actually got a very nice viewing room there. A uh, good chance to see some Pacific lamprey. Um, Hanford Reach Upriver Bright Fall Chinook, largest population of Fall Chinook in the Northwest. Uh, really a tremendous asset uh, for our area, the Columbia River. Supports commercial, tribal, and sport fisheries from Alaska all the way back to the Columbia River. Uh, supports just a whole multitude of fisheries. Uh, Alaska has calls us up from time to time just to check on us and make sure we're doing a good job. Um, once again, we have our local hatcheries, Priest Rapids and Ringgold Springs. They release another 11.8 million juveniles every year, and that's on top of our natural production. Uh, we also have developed a hand for reach. It's called the Hanford Reach Fall Chinook Protection Plan. We actually work with the Upper Columbia Public Utility Districts, BPA, uh, the tribes to basically re-engineer the hydropower operations to improve survival of these fall Chinook. It's actually a fantastic program. Um, historically, fall Chinook spawn really from about the Dalles all the way up to Canada, through the Snake River, all the way up through the Hell's Canyon Dam complex. So really these things, they're main stem spawners, they love big water, and they spawn throughout the Columbian Snake River. Uh, with the development of the hydroelectric system starting really in the late 30s on up through the mid 70s, these populations really declined. If you look at them now, we've got uh, just a handful of spawning areas for fall Chinook uh, down around the Deschutes, a couple in the Snake River, and we've got two of the major spawning areas right here in the Hanford Reach. You can see the whole White Bluffs area. And you can see that one little section, which is Vernita Bar. And so really, we've only got a handful of fall Chinook, you know, major uh, fall Chinook spawning areas at this point in time. Uh, just to kind of give you some more background, one thing really great about having the Department of Energy Hanford site is they've done a, a fantastic job of monitoring uh, fish and wildlife populations. Uh, you can see beginning in the late 40s, they started doing aerial flights through the Hanford Reach, looking to see where these fall Chinook spawned at. Uh, the nest is called a red for salmon. And so if you hear the term red, that's just a fish nest. Uh, and so what they did when they fly through there in the fall is these are very visible. When they turn over the rocks, normally the rocks are discolored. When you turn over the rocks, they're very bright. They stand out. I'll show you some photos of them. And you can see back in the 40s and 50s, there wasn't very many reds through the Hanford Reach. Um, one of them, a Priest Rapids Dam went in in the late 50s and early 60s, uh, and you can see the population started to increase. It's one of the only populations I know of that actually increased after the hydroelectric projects went into place. Uh, and once again, the, the hydroelectric projects worked with us to try and help improve this particular population. Uh, you can see now, uh, this is just the reds. This is not actual fish numbers. This is just how many nests are out there. I'll show you some real numbers here in a minute. Uh, we actually had record returns just a few years ago, 2013 to 2017, just phenomenal numbers. Uh, so this population has grown uh, rather than declining over the years. Uh, just to give you an idea, it's not the best photo in the world unless you get up really, really close. If you can kind of see, this is Vernita Bar. There's a whole bunch of little white specks there along the bar. There's That's actually hundreds of fall Chinook reds. These reds are about eight feet in diameter. So these things are massive. They'll have anywhere from 2,000 to 8,000 eggs in each of those reds. 
so you can see hundreds of them right off of Vernita Bar. A uh, couple of the other major spawning areas just downstream. This is down the 100 F islands. This you can see a little better. See all those white dots? I mean, there's hundreds of them there. These island complexes are fantastic fall chinook spawning areas. They've got good cobble. They've got good velocities. They've got the right depth. And so the water, you get upwelling. So those eggs, once they're deposited, get that aeration. And so they survive all the way through to emergence. Uh, this is the up, upper end of the White Bluffs area. Once again, see all the white dots, literally hundreds and hundreds of dots. I, I really don't want to be the person that has to do the aerial flight and count all these reds. I have no idea how they do it. Uh, and I'm very thankful that they do <clears throat> because it does give us a really good idea on what our population is every year. Uh, also, if you take a boat out in the fall, you can see these reds. You can float right over the top of them. Uh, it's really amazing as the sturgeon will come up. Uh, and so you'll see a six to eight foot sturgeon swimming just a few feet of water in and around these reds. I assume they're vacuuming up some of the excess reds, potentially even consuming some of the jacks or other fish after they die off. Um, one of the terrific things about the Hampton Reach Fall Chinook is called a far north migrating stock. Uh, you can see right there in the red, these things come out of the Columbia River they migrate all the way up to southeast Alaska and then all the way back down to the Columbia River again. They are significant contributors to those southeast Alaska, Canadian, and Washington coastal fisheries. Um, there are several different jurisdictional processes. We got the Pacific Salmon Treaty, Pacific Fishery Management Council. Uh, here in the state of Washington, we also have USV Oregon and USV Washington. Those are basically harvest management agreements between the states and the tribes. Uh, basically how the fish are divvied up, how many are allowed to spawn, how many are available for harvest. Uh, so huge contributors to a lot of fisheries, a uh, very extremely important stock. Uh, now on to some real numbers. And so in terms of numbers of fish, um, you can see the population once again through the 60s, 70s, fairly stable, relatively low. Uh, beginning in the 80s, we start seeing these cycles. And these are normal cycles. Uh, the one here, this last few years, that's not normal. We didn't know what to do when these fish came back. Never seen anything like this. You know, over 200,000 wild fish back uh, there in about 2015. Um, one thing that we have found out really fairly recently, um, Pacific Northwest National Lab there in Richland um, was funded through Grant County PUD, one of our partners, uh, to do some research and some studies. And what they came up with was we need about 31,000 adult fall chinook every year to spawn in the reach to maintain our population. That'll basically maintain a healthy population. Uh, so really, you can see right here in 2007, 8, 9, 10, we fell down below that 31,000. That actually prompted, uh, we now have a harvest management plan where our goal is to meet that 31,000 every year. Uh, when we have numbers above 31,000, we've worked out a sharing program. Every fish over 31,000, the anglers get one and the resource gets one. Uh, so it's going to be, I think, a really effective program uh, to giving the anglers, you know, the opportunity when we have excess fish and, you know, maintaining our population. Uh, I'm going to try and go over this fairly quickly. This is, I could spend a day just on the protection plan. I started off as the Vernita Bar Agreement back in the 80s. Uh, what they noticed is shortly after they put in uh, Priest Rapids, Wampum Dams, as uh, we had all these fish spawning on Vernita Bar. In the fall, the flows can be relatively high, and so the fish spawn all over the Vernita Bar. Um, Typically, flows in the Columbia River are lowest during the winter months. So December, January, February, especially March and April, we have a very, very low flow. So what happens when those flows drop down lower, all the fish that spawned at the higher elevations, all those eggs died off. And so we were losing lots of production. Uh, some really terrific biologists got together. Uh, they found if they kept the flows lower during the daytime hours in the fall, it would get those fish to spawn at lower elevations. And then working with Upper Columbia River PUDs and BPA, they'll actually maintain a flow through the winter months now to keep those reds, now, now they're down at lower elevation, to keep them underwater. 
all the way until those fry emerged from the gravel. So that was really a terrific program. Uh, we've added on to that in recent years. Uh, once the fish emerge from the gravel, they're not great swimmers. They tend to hang out in the near shore areas. And I showed you those fluctuations, how much they vary up and down. So we're losing a lot of fry along those edges. They were basically getting stranded or isolated from the river in pockets. And so we worked with the PUDs, BPA, uh, tribes, everyone to try and also reduce those fluctuations in the springtime now, all the way until these fish are big enough that they can fend for themselves. So we actually have a protection plan that covers these fish from the time they spawn, start spawning until they're just about ready to go to the ocean. So it's been a really terrific program. We've seen some really terrific results with this. Uh, real quickly, back over our hatchery programs, uh, Priest Rapids Hatchery. Uh, both Priest Rapids and Ringgold Springs are operated by Washington Fish and Wildlife. Uh, They're both mitigation programs. Um, Priest Rapids Hatchery is owned and funded through Grant County Public Utility District. Uh, it's mitigation uh, for their operation of Priest Rapids and Wanderplum Dams. Uh, so this is to offset losses of habitat and losses of, of harvest opportunity. So these are actually harvest uh, uh, hatcheries. So the idea is to put these fish out there for harvest. Uh, we don't necessarily need them to support our population in the reach. We're doing just fine with our natural production. Ringgold Springs is part of the Army Corps of Engineers mitigation for John Day and the Dalles dams. And so we're producing fish to offset losses, once again, of habitat and fishing opportunity for the operation of those two dams. Uh, Priest Rapids only produces fall Chinook. Ringgold Springs produces four and a half million fall Chinook plus 250,000 coho juveniles and 180,000 summer steelhead. So it's kind of a multi salmon steelhead hatchery. Uh, hopefully COVID thing lifts a little bit. Uh, normally we have public access to a lot of the WDFW hatcheries and you can check in with me to see what the availability is. Uh, some of them have to have guided tours. Some of them can be self guided tours. Uh, just to give you an idea, uh, each year, normally um, the hatchery pr proportion is anywhere from 30 to 50% of the overall fish that return back to the Hanford reach. Uh, so natural production usually run around 70%, but hatchery does contribute significantly uh, to the Hanford reach returns. Give you a couple more quick overviews. Ringo Springs Hatchery, it's actually earthen ponds. It's not like the standard concrete raceways that you see. There's a nine acre pond uh, where we rear fall Chinook. There's a two and a half acre pond where part of the year we rear, rear steelhead, part of the year we rear, we rear fall Chinook. Uh, these fish are actually released out into the Hatchery Creek and go back into the river. There's a volunteer trap located here, just, uh, just a couple hundred yards upstream from the river. That's where we process the adults that come back. Uh, we do remove those hatchery fish from the river when they come up to the trap. Uh, we do try and keep the number of hatchery fish on the spawning grounds down to a very low number, if at all possible. Uh, down to the very far south, there's actually a couple of vinyl line ponds where we're producing the coho. And those coho are released right here into that irrigation wasteway. Uh, very unique hatchery, very neat access area. You get the chance, go out and give it a visit. Uh, once again, Priest Rapids is somewhat more like a normal hatchery, concrete raceways. It's very unique. Uh, it's about a mile long channel. This channel was actually the first shot at a hatchery. They thought rather than build a hatchery, we'd have a long spawning channel full of gravel. The fish would just come into the channel and spawn in the channel, and then they would move back out after they emerged. Unfortunately, it didn't work too well. Uh, they got some production, but not as much as they would have liked. So they went in and built the standard hatchery. The fish actually have to come in from this channel down at the river, uh, swim up about a quarter of a mile to the adult trap. From there, the adults are trucked up to the main hatchery building. Uh, one thing I'll show you while we got this up, over here just to the south, whoops, go back one, Dana, if you would, just a second. Uh, just to the west of Priest Rapids Dam uh, is the Wanapum Village. Um, this is, I'll, I'll talk just briefly about the Wanapums here in just a second, but this right here below the dam is the Wanapum village. Uh, anyway, go on. Priest Rapids Hatchery, uh, they have adult holding ponds. What they do, they truck those adults from the river 
up to the hatchery. Uh, many of these fish are not ripe at the time they come up to the hatchery. We need about 6,000 adults in order to rear 13 and a half million eggs. Uh, so what we do is we hold those fish alive in these ponds until they're ripe. They'll go through each of these ponds every week, checking the females and males to see if they're ripe. If they're ripe, they'll spawn them, move the eggs to the incubation room. If they're not ripe, they throw them back into the ponds and hold them for another week. Uh, from the incubation room, uh, usually by oh, late January, February, the, the eggs hatch, the fry move out to these other raceways, and eventually into these large channel ponds before being released in uh, mid to late June. One last little thing I want to touch on, very unique to the Hanford Reach. Um, many of you know, Native Americans were the first known inhabitants of the Columbia Basin. Uh, many of the tribes, the Confederated Tribes of the Umatilla Indian Reservation, also the Ackerman Nation, Nez Perce, uh, that came into the Mid-Columbia area primarily during the winter months. Uh, the Wampum tribe is unique in that they live there year round. They still live there year round. Uh, really great uh, tribe. I worked with them fairly closely over the years in terms of fisheries. Um, and once again, they're still there right at the Priest Rapids Dam area. Um, um, the Wampum band, it's small. They're really about 100 members. Uh, they live near Priest Rapids Dam. They're not a legally recognized treaty tribe, and they're not part of the US v. Oregon. The US v. Oregon is that harvest management agreement between the states and the tribes. But in 1939, the Washington State Legislature basically enacted legislation to authorize them a ceremonial and subsistence fishery in that area around Priest Rapids Dam. And so the state works closely with the Wampum group to maintain these fisheries. Uh, one other quick thing to note, when they built Priest Rapids Dam in 59, it flooded out their original village. Uh, Grant County has been, um, did basically move the village and construct some new homes. So now they still have homes in and around the Priest Rapids area. Uh, the Wampum Band, they can fish between desert air downstream to Bernita Bridge. Uh, there's probably oh, six to 12 of the Wampum Band that actively fish. Uh, we have uh, quite a few of their children as well that are on the fishing permit. Uh, they do want to continue to carry on this per, this tradition. Uh, they get issued permits for spring, summer, and fall fisheries. Uh, they It's not a huge operation. You know, it's usually one to three nets, you know, maybe 50 to 100 feet long, uh, but it does get them some fish for ceremonial assistance fisheries. Uh, so it, it is a very unique program. If you ever happen to be out there in the mornings and see the tribes pulling the net, uh, just wave and say hi. Uh, really just a, a excellent bunch of individuals to work with. Um, so with that, I greatly encourage you to go up to the reach, take a boat ride. Um, you can go up into the Hanford Reach National Monument. Uh, there's some really, well, not great roads. Uh, depends on when they were graded last. Uh, some really nice overlooks onto the river. Uh, also, definitely, if you get the opportunity, you know, go out with a guide, uh, even if it's just for a boat ride. Uh, just, just, it's a very unique opportunity right here in our backyard. Uh, be safe when you're out there, and I hope that everyone gets out and really enjoys everything that we have in the state, state of Washington that we can offer in terms of water recreation and fisheries. Paul, thank you so much for that presentation. I know as we've prepared for this event, I learned a ton from from uh, you sharing this with us. So again, thank you so much for being a part of this tonight and sharing this information. Uh, with that, I think we'd like to move into the, the Q&A portion of the night. Um, we've had about uh, five or so folks on our WebEx call and upwards of 46, 47 on the Facebook live stream. We've got a good number of questions in, so I'll go ahead and just uh, start diving into it. Sure. Um, one of these first questions comes from Rachel Little. Uh, Rachel asks, adult fall uh, Chinook returns to the Hanford Reach have climbed and varied while a neighboring fall Chinook stock in the Yakima has been static or declining. What do you think is causing the differences in these two neighboring stocks? Well, I think Rachel set me up for that one. She knows the answer. Um, so with the Yakima River, uh, we have several challenges. Uh, one of them is we've got the invasion of water star grass. It is a native vegetation. Uh, but beginning back in the early 2000s, 
it basically has completely taken over the Yakima River. Uh, fall Chinook just don't seem to want to spawn. Normally, 70% of the fall Chinook spawn in the lower Yakima River. Now it's 70% in the upper Yakima River. On top of that, we have uh, huge predation problems. The smallmouth bass and channel catfish move into the Yakima River about the same time that these juvenile fall Chinook are moving out. We also have uh, a huge, uh, a lot of avian predation. Uh, so these fish now are having to move a longer distance or spawning further upriver, uh, which leads to lower survival uh, within the Yakima River down to the river mouth, plus elevated water temperatures, uh, even into the you know late spring, early summer in the Yakima River. So we have a whole host of challenges uh, trying to maintain that population in the Yakima River. And Rachel's been working with a, a, a group to try and remove water star grass. <laughs> they pulled it by hand. They've got a harvester now. Um, we are we are working on it with a lot of help from our partners. This is not one of the questions, but is it was it water star grass that mucked up the boat races, or was that a different species that mucked up the boat races? Uh, I I think it was a different species. I heard about that, but I didn't get a chance. I mean, we've got. Uh, so many different, uh, primarily invasive species. Water star grass is a native, uh, but we have milfoil, we have pondweed, and they love the Columbia River. The warmer the water, the better. Uh, and as you've seen, if you look in the Yakima River, it looks like a wheat field that's been flooded. I mean, it's just it's just a solid mat shore to shore. Uh, same thing if you get shallower water or near shore waters with slightly lower velocities in the Columbia River, milfoil takes over. Uh, anybody that's ran their boat through it knows. So we had a question through the WebEx that says, do you know why it spiked in 2016? And we're assuming they mean the graphic of uh, return numbers. You know, uh, our thoughts are just a perfect storm. We had really good spawning conditions. We had really good rearing conditions. And one of the keys to this is ocean conditions. We've had some really horrendous ocean conditions now for about the last 20 years. And so we had a combination of just perfect events. Um, one thing to keep in mind, fall Chinook are also older lived salmon. That is, they'll live, you know, they come back at ages three, four, and five years old, even some six year olds, where a lot of fish only spend one or two years in the ocean. Uh, so that kept that, that spike going up. So if you get two or three good years, that'll carry over for a couple more years in the reach. And so, when we first saw that return of the two-year-old fish, what we call jacks, we couldn't believe it. We just thought it was a fluke. Uh, we failed to forecast based off that number. We thought that's just outrageous. Uh, Alaska called, that's one of the phone calls we got from Alaska because we, we way under predicted the next year's return. Uh, so that was just off the chart. And as far as we know, it, once again, it was just, just that perfect set of conditions. So these fish can rebound if the conditions are right. Wonderful. Thank you, Paul. And for everybody watching, you're going to see me looking off to the side. I'm looking at my other screen for the questions. Um, this next question comes from Susan Leckband. Hi, Susan. Uh, the question is, does runoff from farms along the reach contaminate the Columbia with farming chemicals and damage the fish population? You know, dilution is a solution to some extent. Uh, most of us know that you're looking at a, a huge water body, a lot of flow. Uh, it's in some cases, depending on what species it is, uh, you've also got nutrients being carried into the Columbia River. Nutrients, you know, in terms of fish, is usually a good thing. That's increased production. Uh, you can have, you know, other contaminants. Uh, by far and away, the flows are so high; those flows are gone in in a matter of hours. So, what though you do have kind of a constant bleed, could have you know some sort of impacts in near shore areas, depending on what's coming down. Uh, for the most part, most uh, areas are regulated by the Department of Ecology, uh, so we shouldn't see anything really too toxic coming out of any of those side channels. I, ironically, though, we did find um, some of the scientists at PNNL told us a few years ago that there was more uranium coming into the river from the Escotsil drain from the Columbia Basin project. That is, so there's uranium that's a component of fertilizer and more is coming in from the irrigation drains then is actually entering the river from Hanford, which is kind of a weird irony. So let's see, what is the next question? Um, 
goodness. Oh, any idea what the biggest sturgeon has been that's been caught in that area? You know, I don't. Uh, it'd be interesting to call up. I've got several uh, contacts that are guides in the reach. Um, I've talked to a lot of people that fish it. You know, the, the eight to 10 footers are not uncommon. Uh, anything above 10 feet I, is, is fairly rare. Uh, though I'd like to, you know, check with those contacts and see how many fish they actually get above 10. Um, it's hard to trust anglers though, until you put a tape measure on it. You know, I, I always tell people when you're guessing weights, depending on the size of it, subtract off five pounds right off the bat. Uh, so it, it, it is difficult. Plus, you know, you can't take them out of the water. Uh, so uh, trying to, you got to pull them up alongside your boat, put a tape measure on can be a little challenging, but uh, not uncommon, you know, over 10 feet's a little more rare. Uh, but they're definitely out there. I mean, we had a couple of mortalities in that range back in 2015, and we know they're there. Uh, once again, I, I I would go to my experts, which are really some of our area fishermen and guides, uh, to get a real good idea. Cool. Awesome. Um, so, how many? This this question comes from Doug. How many fall chinook slash coho are expected this year uh, to to the Hanford Reach? Uh, this year we're looking between hatchery and wild. Uh, about 133,000 fall Chinook, so pretty big run. This year, we're looking at about 50-50 between hatchery and wild. Uh, so we're expecting, normally we get about five to 15% of the hatchery fish will end up spawning out in the reach. Uh, and most of the rest of those will be collected at the hatchery. So we're looking at a spawning escapement of around 60 to 70,000. Should have a sport fishery somewhere in the 14 to 18,000 range. That's a lot of fish for, for one fishery in one area in just a handful of weeks. So a uh, really good return this year. Uh, we're not gonna have to worry about shutting down the fishery early. Cool. So Jing Lee asked, are, uh, do we have Pacific lamb prey, which you, you mentioned that, um, how are they doing in the reach? I know that some of the tribes down river were doing, they have a hatchery, don't they, at the Umatilla? Reservation, how else are we getting lamprey back in? Um, you know, Ralph Lampman with the Yakima Nation has been doing lamprey work for a number of years. He's got that hatchery program down pat, which is a fantastic program. It is a vitally important species to a lot of folks. The Hanford Reach, uh, I don't know that we have a spawning population at all. I think most of these are just the juveniles are coming down and, and using the sediments in the reach. Uh, and I really don't think we have a good handle on those populations. I would defer to the Yakima Nation and Ralph and those guys to, to really uh, get get some better information on that. I know this year uh, we did have a, a very good lamprey migration. I haven't seen the final numbers yet, but it's supposed to be a little bit of a spike this year, which is a really good sign. Awesome. Um, this next question comes from Anastasia. She asks, why do sturgeon skip years when spawning? You know, I don't know that anybody knows. Um, Send me an email. I'll put you in touch. Uh, Laura Hieronymus, she's been on for several years now. She's our statewide sturgeon manager and our sturgeon expert. When I have questions, I call her and I've got her email address. So uh, contact me. I'll put you in touch with her. Uh, I don't know why that behavior is what it is. Okay, and we can, uh, by the end of the event, we'll share your email one more time just so folks have it. So we'll, we'll share it again at the end of the event so people have a chance to record it. Uh, also, you can also send any questions you have that we can't ask or answer tonight to Hanford at ecy.wa.gov. Uh, and Ginger, I'll let you do the next one. Okay, so Rachel Blomker asked, why are the larger sturgeon impacted by the die-off in the drought heat wave years, but not the smaller ones? I think because, you know, sockeye run, you know, two to about six pounds. And so a smaller sturgeon's not going to be able to prey or consume those sockeye like a larger one. Uh, larger fish, bigger prey items. You know, a six pound sockeye is nothing for an eight foot sturgeon. Uh, you've ever seen the mouths? Uh, it's just like a giant vacuum. Uh, and so they are able to consume a larger prey item. The sockeye were readily available, a huge food source. I mean, everybody knows it eats fresh salmon. Uh, the oils and the meat are, are such great feed, especially in other fish realize that as well. So we think that's really largely the reason why we saw the larger fish die and no effect on the smaller fish. Also, okay. keep in mind the larger fish are your spawners. The smaller fish, you know, they've got to be 
eight to 14 years old before they start to even get into that spawning age. So they're, you know, they're already, that'd be five, really around four to six feet long before they're even starting to mature. And so you're looking at fish that are already in that spawning age range. And that's your, that's your larger fish. And they're able to consume sockeye and they're likely to be more affected by those temperatures. Are, are they, so they're, they're scavengers, aren't they? They're not actively hunting. Oh, oh I, I, I think they, I, they're very opportunistic. Yes, oh, okay. I, I, I wouldn't fast it. if I think if it's there and available, they'd be plenty happy. I've never seen a fish turn down a, a good meal. <laughs> Go ahead, Ryan. <laughs> well, um, yeah, this next question, it, uh, it's kind of along the same lines. You might have touched on this a little bit earlier during your presentation, but uh, this one comes from Cher, and they ask, oh, no, what did our June heat wave this year do to the sturgeon this year? Okay, yeah, and I touched on that. I said this year, the sockeye made it through. We had 150,000 sockeye, still a great return. Our temperatures hit right as the sockeye were kind of peaking, but for the most part, the sockeye made it through the system. In 2015, we had large numbers of sockeye dying off in every pool from really from Bonneville all the way up to the upper Columbia. Uh, this year, we did not see, we didn't, I, I didn't notice any sockeye mortalities. I had some that were in relatively poor condition at the end of the run, but that's not uncommon. And so we didn't have those large number of sockeye available this year. Uh, so the timing was such that the sockeye made it through. Uh, you know, the sturgeon can take the, some heat. They can, you know, it's, and so it's just a combination of factors back in 2015. So Leah Alec asked, were the sturgeon that washed up, did you do any um, testing of contamination on the sturgeon that were found the the, in 2015? No, and we actually, um, we we had numerous meetings. Uh, unfortunately for sturgeon, you basically got to get them almost the minute they died to do a lot of the testing. Um, and once again, the contaminants, I mean, we don't think it was a contaminant issue at all. These sturgeon have been around forever. Uh, so we never really thought of it as a contaminant issue. Uh, so it was a matter of getting at and what, what would cause it. Uh, luckily, the Fraser River had some literature on it. Uh, we're able to talk to bios really throughout the U.S. to kind of pull some information together. Once again, I'm not the expert, but I know the guys, the folks that are. And so, like this year, really same thing: accelerated water temperatures, one dead sturgeon. And I said that's not uncommon. We get fish that die from uh, uh, propeller strikes, dam passage, um, you know, fatigue during uh, fishing. A lot of these oversized sturgeon will get caught multiple times over the course of the year. And so we will see some loss from hooking mortality. Once again, propeller strikes. There's other causes. Uh, I'll, I'll list them as kind of unnatural mortality. Thank you, Paul. Uh, our next question comes from Cher. They say, uh, fishery students, dot, 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 wouldn't that be a great project for them to help with population surveys? You know, I'm hiring right now. Uh, I'll, I'll pay you for it. <laughs> the recruitment <laughs> is out there. Uh, I bring on quite a few staff. Uh, right now, we're monitoring the sport fishery. I'll have six people on for that. I'll bring 15 people on. We sample all the carcasses. We sample the fish in the sport fishery, determine where they're from, the age composition. It's how we do our forecasting. It's how we how we estimate how many fish are coming back. Uh, we look at coated wire tag, which is a small tag in the snout, uh, primarily of hatchery fish, so it tells us the origin. Uh, we pull otolith bones, uh, you know, basically ear bones, which will, we have one hatchery that otolith marks 100% of the fish there, pre strapids. Uh, so we we have staff, and I'm I'm always actively recruiting. Um, we do we have teams at the hatchery to to monitor and evaluate the hatchery programs as well. Uh, so we yeah we have a team of staff, and uh, actually I've had several student programs over the years that have tried to get involved. I haven't had anybody that's quite been successful yet. So uh, feel free to contact me and uh, I'll do what I can to, to get you on board. All right, um, let's see. Have you, Leah had another question. Have you come across any uh, mussels, mussel shells in the reach? You know, we see very few. Uh, there are a few folks that do these surveys throughout the state. And I know the, there has been some interest in the reach. Um, I'd probably have to defer over probably maybe to Mike Ritter or Habitat Program or some other folks. 
Uh, there is like a statewide database where we've been asked when we run across these shells to basically bag them and tag them and ship them. Uh, in my work where I'm looking at sport fisheries and carcass recovery, uh, we don't tend to see them. I, I think also because we're dealing within that zone where the river's fluctuating, so we're dealing with relatively shallow environments. Uh, so we're, and, and ones that are always kind of in that wetted band. So we, not, we, may, we may not be working in a band where you're likely to find these mussels. Thanks again. Um, so this is a follow-up that Ken had from on WebEx from the earlier, uh, the 2016 spike question. And Ken asked, do you expect the 2016 spike to repeat again this year with some of the similar conditions? Oh, as, oh, as far as, no, I said this year, you're talking about for our, our forecast in terms of population for this year? Is that, was that where the correct question's directed? I assume that's it for 2016, so. I believe so, yeah, I was referencing that fall uh, Chinook graphic that we had in the presentation. Okay, yeah, so, no, I, you know, I like to say that's going to be a natural cycle, uh, but I think that was a, a little bit of a one-off where we had such great conditions. This year, we're looking at 133,000 between hatchery and wild. That year, we had like 300,000 between our hatchery and wild program. Our hatchery people were overwhelmed. Uh, you've got a hatchery that normally gets 12 to 16,000 fish, and they got 80,000 back to the hatchery. That's a lot of work. Every fish has to be handled. Uh, so it was an extreme amount of work for our hatchery programs uh, for several years, uh, but we'd be happily take it again. We'll hire more people if we can continue to get those kinds of numbers. Oops, I muted myself. I thought my husband was coming home and my dogs were going to get loud. Uh, <laughs> oh, I just wanted for the people that are watching on WebEx, Rachel Little with the Benton Conservation District answered that it was sago pondweed. Oh. That plant and that was what broke loose and was causing the big weed mats that messed up the boat races. Um, so a next question uh, again from Jing Lee. Can you explain a little about steelhead? I see mention of farm raised fresh from the Columbia. Are there any wild? Also, my son wanted to know, can you show some pictures of Chinook and steelhead? Hmm. Oh, so uh, on the subject of steelhead, uh, so there is a wild population. Um, most most wild populations are struggling. Uh, there are a few areas that are still maintaining a relatively healthy population of wild steelhead. Uh, we have a tremendous number of supplementation programs for steelhead. Um, where we're at in the reach, we just have one hatchery production. We don't really have any natural production to speak of in the Hanford Reach. Uh, we're we're not in this big river is not good habitat for steelhead. Um, but if you start looking, the Yakima River does not have any hatchery supplementation in steelhead. Uh, they have a natural production of steelhead. It is, it's been holding its own now for a lot of years. It's not a huge population. It varies from 1,000 to 10,000, uh, but they have been holding their own. Um, Upper Columbia, the same thing. They're still hanging in there. A lot of hatchery supplementation programs. Uh, the recent several years have been Terrible for steelhead. Uh, this year, we're looking like steelhead returns that we haven't seen since like 1940. Uh, so uh, we think it's largely ocean conditions. Uh, so uh, steelhead are not doing well at the moment. The one thing good is is they tend to rebound quickly, and we have been beating our broodstock for our hatchery program. So we're still getting some hatchery those su hatchery supplementation program. We're still getting some wild fish spawning. Uh, so we're just really hoping things turn around, but it, it's just, God, it's just devastating the last couple of years. And if she'll contact me, I'll I'll send her photos. I'll tell her where you can go drive and see them in the river and watch them live if she'd like. Wonderful. And again, everybody will share the uh, contact information for both our agency and Paul at the end of uh, tonight one more time, just so everybody has it. Um, and the next question comes from Kyle Clemens, and he kind of touched on the topic you just talked about, Paul, but if you have anything else to add, uh, you can. Uh, Kyle asked, why are Chinook holding steady, but steelhead are crashing? Uh, one thing, once again, I kind of mentioned, especially with our fall Chinook, fall Chinook are unique in their slightly older age. So they, uh, most of our wild fish come back at four and five year olds. Uh, steelhead, especially uh, our well-stocked steelhead, upper Columbia steelhead, 
one year in fresh water, one year in the ocean for our hatchery programs, two years in fresh and one year in the ocean. Uh, so they're relatively younger age. They, they take it a lot harder. And if you hit steelhead for a couple of years, you really are hurting that population. Now with my fall Chinook, I can have a couple of bad years. As long as I've got a couple of years inter good intermixed with that, I'm still gonna have a population coming back. And so I may have a lot fewer three-year-old fish, but I'll have a strong component of four-year-olds. The next year, I may have a strong component of three-year-olds and not so many four-year-olds. And so it's multiple age groups in with that fall Chinook production, uh, as opposed to steelhead or coho, where really most of them are out in the ocean from one year and back again. Uh, so uh, once again, you've got a mixed group of ages with fall Chinook uh, as you move through coho and steelhead a much lower ner um, number of age groups in those returns. Interesting. Okay. So Sean Donnelly asked, and I don't know, you may have to take, refer him to somebody in a, in a different division. Are white sturgeon surveys, uh, are there white, white sturgeon surveys in the Snake River that monitor the populations over there? The public would like to understand population objectives that should be met to allow sturgeon retention. That's they're in the same boat we are, and that was kind of our hope. Right now, we've got a sturgeon program that monitors the four lower river reservoirs. It's the same team. They do below Bonneville one year. They do Bonneville pool the next year. The Dallas pool the next year. The John Day pool. So they are they're booked up. What we need is a whole new team that would do. McNary Reservoir one year. They do Ice Harbor Reservoir the next year. They do Lower Monumental uh, Reservoir the next year, and then finally Lower Granite Reservoir. So basically, they would do the same type of rotation. So we're going to need a whole new team, a whole new set of equipment, and so it is, uh, you know, relatively a big ask in terms of funds because we're going to need all new everything. Uh, but the Snake River, yes, they are in that situation. Unfortunately. Um, the public utility districts in Upper Columbia really jumped on board. They've got supplementation programs. They've got population assessments. Uh, they're they're putting the bill uh, for a lot of that sturgeon work in the Upper Columbia. We just haven't got there yet for McNary Pool or the Snake River at this point in time. Uh, and so we've got we've got some challenges. You know, trying to basically manage a population that you don't know what you've got. Thank you, Paul. Uh, well, this one question... thing I should say is they did go, I'll, I'll correct myself, uh, they did go into the Snake River here within the last couple of years and do a stock assessment. I'm sorry, I completely forgot. Um, if they want to contact me, I can see if that information is available. They only get a couple of reservoirs, either one or two, uh, and I can check with Laura on that to see where they went and what they found. So this next question is a, is a good one. It comes in from James Roberts and James asks, are any volunteer opportunities available for anyone who would like to get involved in this area? Yes, <laughs> I love my volunteers. I've got a project. We're gonna be collecting wild broodstock here over Halloween weekend. Uh, we'll probably handle somewhere between 800 and 1500 wild fish. We're gonna have anglers catch them. We're gonna move them uh, from the shorelines to the hatchery and use them for wild broodstock in our hatcheries. Uh, great program. I need always need fish handlers. Uh, you know, we have to move those fish live from the boats up to the trucks. Uh, we also need uh, help pretty routinely. If you've got a strong back, Ringgold Springs Hatchery always needs help moving adults around. Uh, then there's a few other volunteer programs that they pop up from time to time. Uh, we also have the WDFW has a volunteer program where you can go online, register with WDFW. It's called Service. And you can see how many volunteer programs are out there, maybe in your area. And then I would still encourage you to contact local biologists to see what kind of programs we might have. Uh, I know our wildlife program uses a lot of volunteers. I use volunteers. Yes, so there, there are volunteer opportunities. And that just conjures up a funny image of moving live fish. Uh, uh, be, be aware, you know, there there is with, with COVID, it, it has made it a bit more challenging. Uh, yeah. So, with the volunteer programs, we're, of course, adhering to all the state and federal uh, protocols uh, for COVID. And so, in some cases, uh, volunteers are required, you know, vaccinations required and so on. There's a lot of daily routines that we go through as a government agency 
uh, but it doesn't stop us from getting and using volunteers. Sounds fun. Um, so the next question is from Paul Verlin, I believe, Verellen. Uh, when is the season opening on the reach for Fall Chinook? Right now, it uh, opens up August 16th. Um, it'll continue on um, the lower section of the reach from the old Hanford town site down stays open through October 31st. Uh, above the old Hanford town site, it closes after October 15th. The reason for that is, is all our spawning is in that upper section. And so we shut it down on the 15th, which corresponds to about the time the fish start spawning. So we don't want people fishing on top of spawning fish. The lower river really don't have nearly as much spawning habitat. Uh, there's usually a few, a few fresh fish still around. Uh, so it's opened up August 16th. The fish are on their way right now. If you ever look at the fish counts, uh, there's also a great website for looking at fish counts through the dams. Uh, we just started getting five, 6,000 a day through Bonneville. It takes about seven days from Bonneville to the reach. Uh, so really by the weekend or so, we should start seeing some fish. The fishery really gets good starting about mid-September through the first week of October. That's kind of the, the peak of the season. These fish come back ready to spawn. Uh, what that means is they go dark or white really fast. And so they're not like spring Chinook or summer Chinook that have a lot of fat reserves. And so they're best when you get them early because uh, they're going to come back just about ready to spawn. Once again, they're coming back September, October, mid-October, they're, they're, they're hitting the spawning areas. Uh, so I would definitely encourage you, especially by mid-September, end of September, good time to be out there, good return this year. Uh, we do have some, some a decent bank fishery at Ringgold. Uh, if you've got a boat, we, they're fishing right now in town, uh, the, really all through the Hanford Reach. There's, there's, it's primitive boat launches, uh, but it's a pretty easy access to the fishing grounds. A lot of the best fishing spots are within a quarter mile of the boat launches. So you don't really have to go very far to get into some fish. But having a boat definitely does help. Some great information. Uh, this next question, you, you definitely touched on the fisheries during your presentation. Um, this is kind of in that realm of the fisheries. Uh, Brandon Collier asks, what is the expecting return of coho returning to the Ringgold hatchery for the first return? You know, it's the first return. <laughs> we basically have absolutely no idea. We know we had a bunch of jacks come back last January. These are fish that left the hatchery, just went down to the ocean, said, nah, went back to the hatchery. Uh, and we had several hundred of those, which we're thinking is going to be a strong indication that we're going to have a lot of adults back this year. Uh, this being the first year, we have absolutely no idea what kind of returns we're going to get out of that release. Um, our plan is we do have the volunteer trap at, at the hatchery, and so it'll be open and we'll be processing fish every week, and sometimes a couple times a week. And so we're, we're hoping that'll give us a handle on those coho. Uh, the fishery is open for Chinook and coho right now. So if you get coho, you can keep them, hatchery or wild. Uh, we'll go through that. Fishery goes through the end of October. If we find those coho are running a little later and we still got fish that are in good condition, uh, we could actually keep that fishery open all the way till the end of December. Uh, so we do have a provision there. We may make it bank only. We may keep it as is. We may change the area. It's it's a first year, so that we've got like a, a wide list of options, and we'll try and uh, really kind of make those decisions as we go along this fall. But keep in mind that bank fishery at Ringgold could be really good fishery this year because those coho and fall chinook are both going to be coming back to the Hatchery Creek and that irrigation canal. That's really cool. Um, so we, for those of you on WebEx that can't see the, the feed for Facebook, uh, Rick Erickson shared that in 1970, he caught a sturgeon that was over 15 feet, six inches in the White Bluffs area. So, um, that's, that's fun. It's hard to imagine a fish that big, um, on the, you <laughs> see one, the biggest one I've seen up close and personal was an 11 footer. Yeah. And it's, it's massive. We got it up and it was, it, it was like a submarine coming to the surface. You can't imagine how big an 11 foot sturgeon is. It's, and he said that was how big, Ginger? Uh, he said it was six, sorry, I scrolled up, fifth, 15 feet, six inches. Yeah, that's, that's just absolutely massive. You know, you know cars aren't that big. 
Yeah, I had a classmate that allegedly caught one that was 14 feet around 1980, and it took him about six hours to land it. Yeah, that's that's the other challenge. Those big fish, you really have to have the right tackle. You can overplay them. Yeah. I don't. Do you see any more questions, right? James, yep, uh, James Robert said he was an ecologist from New Zealand, and I don't, I don't know, James, are you in New Zealand or you're from New Zealand so you don't have a work permit because you could volunteer, I'm sure, even without a work permit. <laughs> Um, oh, yeah, it's a volunteer, so it, it's yeah, yeah. different rules apply. <laughs> so, Paul, we had uh, one other question from Stacy asks, is there any wild coho production being observed in the reach? So, you know, coho, I, we have documented coho spawning primarily where I've documented it. I was actually in the Ringgold Springs Hatchery Creek uh, a couple of years there. Coho, it seems like to me, they, they tend to spread out and stray and find new waters. Um, we see in the Yakima River, every little tributary will attract coho. Uh, plus now with all our irrigation returns, now where we're pulling irrigation water out, say from upper Yakima River reservoirs, or in this case, upper Columbia River, River reservoirs, we get some false attraction. But it seems like to me, those coho tend to seek out and find new waters. Um, I haven't seen, I've only seen it a little bit, just really in that one spot in the Hanford Reach, but I won't say that I've really gone out and looked for it in the Reach. Uh, once again, there, coho tend to be really small tributary spawners. It doesn't take a lot of water for a coho to spawn. As a matter of fact, it's amazing how small the tributaries uh, you can have coho spawning in. So really the Reach is not what I would call coho habitat. Uh, we rarely ever find a coho carcass when we're doing our carcass surveys. We collect anywhere from two to 20,000 carcasses every year and the coho or you know maybe one or two out of an entire collection so and we had one question that just asked are you able to rewatch this event and uh i'll put this in the chat but the answer is yes the recording will be immediately available um after it buffers on facebook so that could be anywhere from a half hour to an hour or so or even a couple minutes I'm going to go ahead and upload the recording to YouTube uh, sometime tomorrow. It should be up by the afternoon time. And with that, I think we have maybe one or two other questions. Uh, uh, Ginger, do you want to ask one of those ones? Sure. I got the from Isaac Lewis. Is He's curious if there's any information about pike in the lower Columbia. What is the threat to salmon and steelhead from the pike minnow? You know, that's one that I can defer over. If you contact me, we have a whole team of aquatic invasive species experts. Uh, we actually recovered what we think might be a northern pike from uh, a backyard in Finley. <laughs> so, uh, and we're doing the, the DNA analysis on it right now. Uh, we don't know if, if a fisherman brought it back and didn't want to clean it, or it was orig originally seen by a bird of prey in his yard. So it, we don't know once again if a hawk picked it up and came over and dropped it. Uh, we do get reports, odd reports, northern pike. Uh, we had alligator gars there in the lower Yakima River last year. Uh, most of these are kind of that one off. They're very, very rare sightings. Uh, we're trying to keep it very, very rare sightings. We've got you know teams in the upper Columbia that are doing nothing but trying to remove northern pike. Uh, our habitat would support northern pike if they got here. Uh, it's hard to say, given the predation population we have right now, uh, what effect it would have. Uh, we would just as soon not find out. And so we're going to continue with those control efforts. Uh, if you find one, take a photo of it and contact me right away. Uh, we are definitely closely looking at any invasive species or any new species that are coming into the area. So, and uh, this one's more of a comment, but it could be a fun question for you to kind of end the questions on. Um, you ever get to see the eagles fish there? Oh, I, I actually, one thing good about going through the reef, especially in the winter time, is the eagles are always, you know, they, they really get into that white bluffs area during the winter. They're pretty spectacular. I know the population's on the rise, but I still think it's amazing when you see a bald eagle. Uh, we do have kind of a resident winter population. Uh, the REACH staff is constantly monitoring those bald eagles to see if they successfully nest. I know there for a year that, and unfortunately the Canadian goose were, are, are very vicious. They apparently drive the eagles out. I hate to paraphrase that. I'll check to our, our wildlife experts. I know very little about it, but uh, I, I do enjoy seeing them out there and I have seen them out there uh, 
feeding and you know they're pretty opportunistic kind of like the sturgeon feeding on sockeye there they'll usually take what's available awesome and i think that might wrap up our questions ginger do you see any questions or have any more questions for paul I, oh somebody asked any sorry my dogs are excited about something have you ever seen any muskie out here not i see them all the time at ringgold springs hatchery oh do you they okay. they rear them there. They actually are the tiger muskie program for the state of Washington. I have not seen them outside of the hatchery raceways though. Okay, they are contained. We don't release them in the Columbia River, uh, but we do typically raise several thousand. It's it's a tiger muskie. It's a cross, so it's like a mule. It's a sterile hybrid, and so even if they were to get out, they're sterile. They're not like a true muskie which can reproduce. These are a northern pike muskie cross. So they are sterile and they are not released into the Columbia River system. But Ringgold Springs does rear them. So if you ever want to see a juvenile one, they rear them up to oh, up to anywhere from 12 to about 16 inches in length. Cool. Where are those being stocked then? Um, Merwin, Mayfield, uh, Newman. There's about seven lakes. There's a couple up in the Spokane area. There's some more down north of the Vancouver area. Uh, so they're, they are being stocked in a few reservoirs. Super. Okay. Well, thank you everyone so, so much for coming and watching tonight and all the great questions. As we mentioned, this event is recorded, has been recorded and um, will be on Facebook shortly. And Ryan will also put it on the ecology YouTube page. And if you have any more questions, you can send them to us at Hamford at ecy.wa.gov. Um, we have several more Let's Talk about Hanford events scheduled in the next couple months. We're going to be talking about um, Hanford History Part 2. And if you missed Part 1, you can find that on our YouTube channel. And uh, that'll be in September. And then we're going to talk about Hanford habitat and wildlife. So the, the mammals and non-fish creatures um, that live in the Hanford area with Paul's colleagues from Fish and Wildlife and also the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. And um, thank you so much, Paul, for helping us with this episode. Do you have any last minute thoughts that you'd like to share? Uh, no, I just really appreciate the chance to uh, to join in. And I, I actually watched a couple of the earlier presentations and uh, really enjoyed them. Great program. Uh, thanks for making me a part of it. All right, well, with that, uh, thanks everybody and have a great night. Thanks everyone, have a good night.